All right. So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Poetry Jam Cabaret, live here at the Belmar Public Library. Uh, tonight, we have me and Art Viel over here, and we have a, a whole series of poems for you tonight. So, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm going to start today with a, uh, a couple of humorous poems, something I think will be fun for everybody. And I'm going to start with one um, called The Four Nights Drunk. And it's uh, anonymous. We don't have a, a, an author name, but it's a fun one. So let's give it a shot. Four Nights Drunk. The first night when I came home, drunk as I could be, I found this horse in the stable where my horse ought to be. Come here, little wifey. Explain yourself to me. Why is there a horse in the stable where my horse ought to be? Why, you darn fool, you blame fool, can't you plainly see? It's only a milk cow my mama gave to me. Now, I've been living in this here world 40 years and more, and I ain't never seen a milk cow with a saddle on before. <laughs> the second night when I came home, drunk as I could be, I found a coat in the closet where my coat ought to be. Come here, little wifey, explain yourself to me. Why is there a coat in the closet where my coat ought to be? Why, you darn fool, you blame fool, can't you plainly see? It's only a coverlet my mama gave to me. Now, I've been living in this here world 40 years and more, and i never seen a coverlet with buttons on before. <laughs> the third night when I came home, drunk as I could be, I found a hat hanging on the rack where my hat ought to be. Come here, little wife. Explain yourself to me. Why is there a hat hanging on the rack where my hat ought to be? Why, you darn fool, you blame fool, can't you plainly see? It's only a chamber pot which my mama gave to me. Now, I've been living on this here world 40 years and more, and I had never seen a J.B. Stetson chamber pot before. <laughs> the fourth night, when I came home, drunk as I could be, I found a head lying in the bed where my head ought to be. Come here, little wifey, explain yourself to me. Why is there a head lying on the bed where my head ought to be? Why, you darn fool, you blame fool, can't you plainly see? It's only a cabbage head my mama gave to me. Now, I've been living on this here world 40, year, 40 years and more, and I ain't never seen a cabbage head with a mustache on before. <laughs> by an honest. <laughs> well done. That no, was funny. That's a good one right there. And um, the uh, although I, I like this one because it it has that repetition to it that mm -hmm. keeps it interesting and flowing in, in many ways. So um, the next one that I have over here is the Constant Cannibal Maiden by Wallace Irwin, and this was published in the book. Uh, back in 1904, and this is a fun one uh, about uh, something that young sailors of the day should take heed. So, the constant cannibal maiden. Far, oh far, is the mango island. Far, oh far, is the tropical sea. Palms a slant and the hills of the smile, and a cannibal maiden awaiting for me. I've been deceived by a damsel Spanish and Indian maidens, both red and brown, a black-eyed Turk and a blue-eyed Danish, and a Puritan lassie of Salem town. For the Puritan prue she sets in the offing, a cast in her eyes at a tall marine, and the Spanish minx is the worst at scoffing of all of the women I have ever seen. But the cannibal maid is a simple creature, with a habit of gazing over the sea, a hoping in vain for the day I'll meet her, and constant and faithful a yearning for me. Me Turkish sweetheart, she played me double, eloped with the sultan, harem indeed, and the Danish damsel made me trouble when she ups and married an Abu Swede. 
But there's truth in the heart of the maiden of mango. Though her cheeks be black like this kiln baked cork, as she sits in the shade of the wingo wango, awaiting for me with a knife and fork. <laughs> <laughs> By Wallace Irwin. <laughs> she loves you so much, she would eat. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so there's a couple that I have for now. I have a couple more. But, uh, Art, would you like to come up and uh, tell a few? Yeah, sure. I'll read a couple of poems. All right. All right. So uh, today I'm going to be reading by a, um, a current poet. Her name is uh, Amy Nezakuma Tottle. Um, I just call her Amy Nez because her last name is, you know, has a lot of letters in it. And uh, uh, she is a poet and an author, a mother, a wife, and she teaches uh, in the fine arts program at the, uh, at the University of Mississippi. So I'm going to read two of her poems from her collection, Oceanic. The first one is called Penguin Valentine by Amy Metz. Praise the patient of the, let me start over again with that. <laughs> no worries. <clears throat> Praise the patience of the Papa Penguin I don't envy those dark, starlit nights with only the occasional greenish-blue current of the auroras across his claws. See how sweetly he holds the egg close to his brood pouch. And I am certain his fierce tenderness would scare even a crab-eater seal five times his size. What exactly does the Papa Penguin register in a nighttime that lasts two whole months. During those days of no sun, does he remember the particular bend of his mate's neck, that hint of yellow near her ears? Or does he hunger for a slip of hooked squid, worry the grand gulp of air he must take, the concentration needed to slow down his own heart? Praise and faithfulness, the resolve, the lancelet feathers shaped like tiny spears, perfect to poke through a cartoon, cartoon heart and signal Valentine. And Valentine, I sing your praises, not because I know you wait for me like that, though I know you would if you could, but because you never waver. I don't know how you know what direction to look, and how to listen for my return, even when my call boils from the floor of the darkest Arctic sea, even if, for now, all we can feel is a cast of red crabs stretching before our path. Amy. Mm. And she spells it A-I-M-E-E. -E. Oh, okay. A-I-M-E-E, -E. yeah. Okay. So, to poetry in her first name. So what drew you to that poem? Uh, I like the vision of the father penguin, um, you know, taking care of his little nestling over the dark winter to keep it warm. Mm. Uh, I only recently found out that I'm going to be a grandfather for hey, the first time. Congratulations. So I think of my son-in-law, who would be the protector of that little creature. Mm -hmm. So the Papa Penguin of the household there. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So I have a second one by Amy. Now you might remember last poetry jam, I mentioned the word obad. Mm. It was a new word to me. I had to look it up. It meant a song or a poem of the morning. And sure enough, here I am looking at another poet's work, and there's the word again. Oh, wow. Now, 
when it doesn't happen too many times during a poem, I'll go and look it up. Mm -hmm. This one had a second word oh. that needed me to go to the dictionary. And that word is Mikasso. Mikasso is the point on a sword or a knife near the hilt where the blade is no longer sharpened and there's a flat piece of steel. Mm, okay. So, as you might not be surprised, every single part of almost every single thing has in its own name. <laughs> the Ricasso is that part. And it would also be found on a pen knife, a folding knife, where the flat point near the pivot would be found. Mm. So, you'll need to keep that in mind for this poem. This is called Oban with Cutlery and Crickets. In the dinner I cook for myself tonight, you are an open drawer of cutlery. I smell the top notes of the butter knives at your shoulders and tang hidden in the blade of your walk. I need a serving spoon to scoop dal into the cool ceramic a fork with tines long enough to pierce the skin of a butternut squash roasted in honey juice. Even your hands have been a kind of instrument, delicate enough to slide crab meat out of the shell, sturdy enough to crack the best breastbone if need be. Or maybe what I smelled that morning, still full of starlight and crickets when we said goodbye, was the clean coolness of the knife's ricasso, the flat rest of the thumb just before the blade disappears into the handle. Mm. So, two poems by Amy Nez, and uh, now I'll turn it back over to you, okay. and uh, you could read a couple, and then I'll come back and read a few more myself. All right. From a different poem. Well, that's different. Okay. Cool. All right, Lewis. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> huh, welcome. Thanks. Okay, so I have a couple of poems. I'm going to do one by uh, also another anonymous. What is that? It's called Roy Bean. Now, it sounds like it may be associated with the John Wayne movie, Judge Roy Bean, but uh, it doesn't sound like a direct thing, but you can decide for yourself. So Roy Bean by Anonymous. Cowboys, come and hear of Roy Bean in all his glory. All the law west of the Pecos was his line. You must let our ponies take us to a town on lower Pecos where the high bridge spans the canyon thin and fine. He was born one day near Toya where he learned to be a lawyer and a teacher and a barber for his fame, for his fare. He was a cook and an old shoe mender, sometimes preacher and bartender. It cost two bits to have him cut your hair. He was certain sure a hustler and considerable a rustler, and at mixing up an eggnog he was grand. He was lively, he was merry, he could drink a Tom and Jerry. On occasion, at a roundup, took a hand. You may find the story funny, but once he had no money, which for him was not so very strange and rare. And he went to help Pat Landed when he got so absent-minded that he put his RB brand on old Pat's steer. <laughs> now Pat was right smart angry, so Roy Bean went down to Langtree, where he opened up an office and a store. There he'd sell you drinks or buttons or another um, rancher's muttons, though the latter made the other fellow sore. Once there came from Austin City a young dude reputed witty. Out of being, he thought he'd quickly take a rise. And he got frisky as he up and called for whiskey. And he said to Bean, now hurry, damn your eyes. On the counter threw ten dollars, and it very quickly follows that the barkeep took full nine and gave back one. Then the stranger gave a holler as he viewed his single dollar, and at that commenced the merriment and fun. For the dude, he slammed the table just as hard as he was able. That the price of whiskey was too high, he swore. Said Roy Bean, cause of your fussin' and your most outrageous cussin', you are fined the other dollar by the law. 
<laughs> By anonymous right there. So that's a funny one right there. It's based in old in the old west. Um, I hope you enjoyed that one right there. I really like those period poems. See, they take us back to the time different from our own. And so it gives you some insight on how people were thinking at that time, you know, the kind of poetry that they created. Mm -hmm. Especially the, when you use the words of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that in Gunga Din, we saw that in when you did the story of uh, their show, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Curfew Shall Not Ring Tonight, that one right there. Mm -hmm. So it, it always takes us back to a, a whole different time, brings it to a whole different world. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so great about poetry, it takes us many places. And times. So this next one is another one of those where I like to read the lyrics of a song. And again, a lot of songs' lyrics have started as poetry or poems. And when you hear them spoken, it's so different than when you hear them sung. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you actually find and understand some of the words that you may not understand how they're sung. So, Today I'm going to do uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and uh, it's a classic. It's a it's one of the uh, anthems of the American music set. So uh, here it goes. Uh, and which was, by the way, this the words were written by uh, Julia Ward Howe uh, back in the day. So Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed his fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built in him an altar in the evening dews and dance. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel, written in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my contenders, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero, born of woman, crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Julia Wardhouse. Great, good job too. You that, know, that, that just like the, uh, poetry can take you to different places and different times, it can stir that spiritual feeling and bring you closer to a religious faith. Or you know, that might fit in the genre that I would call the Christian soldier. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's being supported in an important role by their faith. And they're speaking of that in their poetry. And the poetry gives rise to a reason to fight, a reason to, mm -hmm. if we are going to fight and do these harsh deeds, you know, to do them in the name of, of something or someone of, of greater than them mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. very motivational and very, mu very much stirring for them to do. Mm -hmm. And this is a classic. Uh, that is, uh, again, part of the American canon of music mm -hmm. and, and song. Um, so uh, I have those two. Do you have a couple more? I do. All right. All right. I'll do two more after that. Sounds good. All right. All right. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about going back over some of the poems that had been part of the Poetry Jam since April because of the value of hearing poems more than once. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to uh, start um, with this poem by Rebecca Elson, who I think was the first poet 
that I read of um, or read from. Uh, Rebecca was uh, born in Canada and her father was a, an academic geologist and in the summer when school was out uh, Rebecca would go with her father on field trips through Canada to study the shores of the lakes, the geological features of the shores in, uh, of the lakes in Canada. And on the long car rides, she would compose poetry. And uh, as she got older and she was going to college, she continued to write poetry and wondered if she shouldn't specialize in English as her, um, her subject, but she became uh, very interested in astronomy and turned out to become a, a, an astronomy researcher that studied novas. But she got ill at an early age with cancer and lived about nine years with her diagnosis and then passed on before the age of 40. And this is one of her poems from that time called Anecdotes for the Fear of Death <clears throat> by Rebecca Elson. Sometimes, as an antidote to the fear of death, I eat the stars. Those nights, lying on my back, I suck them from the quenching dark till they are all, all inside me, pepper hot and sharp. Sometimes instead, I stir myself into the universe, still young, still warm as blood. No outer space, just space. The light of all the not yet stars drifting like a bright mist and all of us and everything already there, but unconstrained by form. And sometimes it is enough to lie down here on earth besides our long ancestral bones, to walk across the cobble field of our discarded skulls, each like a treasure, like a chrysalis, thinking whatever left these husks flew off on bright wings. It's Rebecca. I liked that poem. I remember the first time you did that. I thought it was really good at how she talked about the stars and how she how it meant so much to her to, to reach out and soak it in as if she knew how important it was to be connected to that to, to enjoy nature because life is short you know i think that's exactly what she was doing she was you know using her knowledge of astronomy her interest in you know love of the stars to help deal with what she was going through, and she did it through poetry. Mm. So I'm also going to read my own poem. Hey. My own single one time, maybe one and done poem. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> at the time that I read this, I didn't have a title for it. It was an untitled poem. But now I'm calling the poem Insomnia. So Insomnia by Arthur Veilleux. Late at night at half past 12, I sit in my robe half dressed, a book in my hand half open, my arms on the table rest. My eyes half closed, my back half bent, I read but half a page, and only just half comprehend the point the writer made. With half a shrug, I half decide to read the half I miss. But there is only half a chance I could accomplish this. Still half reluctant, half compelled, I halfway raise my gaze. With half a smile I grumble, my place on the page a haze. With half a mind I have to say, I half give up my task. I have a half suspicion, it's more than I should ask. So with resolve I halfway swear and halfway compromise, half-hearted, shut the book again, go upstairs and close my eyes. <laughs> Insomniac, huh? <laughs> yeah.
You know, wait. I got better sleep. over time. <laughs> you know, wait. You can't sleep. You can't read. You don't even have things done. Half done. And you're yeah. Everything's just half half assed. <laughs> All right, you your it. turn to finish this up. All right, let's close this out. Um, I kind of lost my place here for a second. Give me one second. Um, okay, let's see here. Hang on, let's look it up real fast. I lost my place in the book, so I gotta look up real quick. I think I will. Do, I will do Clementine after all. Yeah. Clementine. Clementine is everyone. Uh, everyone knows. You know, oh my darling, oh my darling. <laughs> okay, that is um, was written back in the 1800s, and it has gone through various versions uh, over the years, and so. Um, that I'm going to read is a shortened version of it. It's not the same. The original version is a little longer. But this one here captures uh, uh, the main thrust of it for So this is Clementine. Um, although the book says anonymous, or are, there is an author. I shouldn't put it over there, so my apologies. Uh, I'll put that in the video. Um, so Clementine. In a cavern, in a canyon, Excavating for a mine, dwelt a miner, 49er, and his daughter, Clementine. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, my darling Clementine, you are lost and gone forever. Dreadful sorry, Clementine. Like she was and like a fairy, and her shoes were number nine. Herring boxes without topses, sandals were for Clementine. <laughs> Drove her ducklings to the water every morning just at nine, hit her foot against a splinter, fell into the foaming brine. Ruby lips above the water, blowing bubbles soft and fine. Alas for me, I was no swimmer, so I lost my clementine. In a churchyard near the canyon, where the myrtle doth entwine, there grow roses and other posies fertilized by clementine. Then the miner, 49er, soon began to droop and pine, thought he ought to join his daughter. Now he's with his Clementine. In my dreams she still doth want me, robed in garments soaked in brine. Though in life I used to kiss her, now she's dead, I draw the line. <laughs> well, that's Clementine right there. Okay. And the other one that I have here, uh, let's see here. This was, where was it? The Chaperone, written by Henry Coyler Bunner. Now, Chaperone is a, is a twist where, it's one of those stories where two people are doing something, well, one person thinks they're doing it one reason, when in reality it's doing it for another reason. And you'll see. It's called the chaperone. I take my chaperone to the play. She thinks she's taking me. And the gilded youth who owns the box, a proud young man is he. But how would his young heart be hurt if he, if he could only know that not for his sweet sake did I go, nor yet to see the trifling show, but to see my chaperone flirt. Her eyes beneath her snowy hair, they sparkle young as mine. There is scarce a wrinkle in her hand, so delicate and fine. And when my chaperone is seen, they come from everywhere. The dear old boys with silvery hair, with old-time grace and old-time air, to greet their old-time queen. They bow as my young Midas here will never learn to bow. The dancing masters do not teach that gracious reverence now. 
With voices quavering just a bit, they play their old parts through. They talk of folk who used to woo, of hearts that broke in 52. Now none the worst for it. And as those aged crickets chirp, I watch my chaperone's face, and I see the dear, and I see the dear old features take a new and tender grace. And in her happy eyes I see her youth awakening bright, with all its hope, desire, delight. Ah me, I wish that I were quite as young, as young as she. <laughs> By Henry Tyler Bonner. Nice. So, really fun little poem. Yeah. Uh, I guess the chaperone is not always out of her game either, right? You know, that's something that's surprising in the poem is, as you said, you think that the poem is going to be about the woman being taken by the chaperone, but it's actually the woman observing the chaperone mm -hmm. and observing her with, you know, fondness and, and interest and, you know, maybe even a little bit of envy in the end, you know? This is true, you know? And not only that, it's as if that fondness carries over basically just maybe she, like she said, she, this is a trifling show. She's not there for the show. She could care less. She's doing it for her. She chaperone. wants to see her chaperone flirt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She wants to see her have fun. It's yeah. very, very nice. Yeah. Very, very uh, nice. So um, that is going to bring tonight's Poetry Jam to a close. I want to thank everybody for watching and enjoying us right here. So I want to thank Art Veo over here for uh, coming to share his poetry. Now, the next Poetry Jam is going to be on Wednesday, August 7th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so make sure you join us then. We have more poets coming in. And come and join us and share some poetry here. If, if you write poetry, if you enjoy reading poetry, join us. It's a lot of fun and we'll have a great time. So once again, thank you for watching. Have a great day and have a great evening. Good night. Good night.